Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for December 26th is 1 John. It's the first of three letters written by John, the disciple turned apostle, the same John who was considered to be Jesus' best friend, who wrote the gospel according to John, these three letters, and Revelation. He begins by stating why he has the authority to write these letters to encourage the saints. He begins, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. In other words, we are eyewitnesses and not just eyewitnesses. We also heard him speak. We walked with him for years. We touched him. We hugged him. I leaned against him at the dinner table when we were celebrating the last Passover before his crucifixion. What was from the beginning? It's the word of life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The word was with God. He, the word, was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. This Jesus, this word of God, whom we have seen, whom we have touched, whom we've heard, who we lived with for three years and traveled with, the word of life, that life was revealed to us in very specific and real ways. So we have seen it and we testify to you what we speak is a testimony of what we have seen. John is saying, I'm not telling you about something I heard from somebody else. No, I'm sharing with you what I've seen personally, what I've experienced. You are learning from my experience. And in humility, he doesn't go so far as to say he was Jesus' best friend, but he was. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete, so that our joy may be complete. There's a minor variation there, depending on which manuscript your particular Bible has come from. So whether it's your joy, meaning us and everybody who is a recipient of this letter, or our joy, meaning John and the other apostles, or whoever it was that he was traveling with, maybe he was referring to himself and Jesus Christ. I'm writing this letter to you so that our joy may be complete. And this is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness whatsoever. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet there's darkness in us and we're still in sin, then we're liars. It's not to say that we've never sinned or that we don't continue to sin, but when we sin, we must repent. We can't continue on in open, unrepentant sin because you, if you are in open and unrepentant sin, you're not following him. And if you're not following him, then you're not of him. And those who follow for a little while and then go off into the world and do their own thing, they were never really following him, not for his sake, maybe for their own. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. The entire Bible is written for the most part on a fifth grade reading level. It's accessible to everyone for the most part, but every once in a while we come across a word like propitiation, or perhaps your Bible says atoning sacrifice in chapter 2, verse 2. Jesus is our propitiation. He's our atoning sacrifice. That word really means it's the sacrifice that takes away the wrath of an angry God. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God, and not only for us who believe, but also for the whole world. There's nothing left that's not undone. For anyone who wants to say that Jesus only died for some people, that says here in plain language, not only for us, but for the whole world. Anybody who suffers the wrath of God, it's simply because they rejected the propitiation the appeasing sacrifice. 
It's already been paid for. All of your sin has already been paid for from the foundations of the world before you were even created, before you walked this walk, before you came into this world, it was already paid. Even before anyone, before Adam fell, it was already planned. God had already done it outside of time. His wrath has been appeased. We are set free. One phrase John uses a lot in this letter is, this is how we know. This is how. This is how. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commands. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him or abides in him should walk just as he walked. Do we walk around looking at life, trees, the sky, and teaching the people around us how all of these things equate to and show the kingdom of God? Do we walk around having compassion on people, loving people, washing the feet of the one who would betray us? Even now the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the things of the world, these things that are passing away, these things that we have today but are gone tomorrow, the things that moth and rust destroy, that thieves can break in and steal. If you love those things, the love of the Father is not in you. It is the last hour. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Anti means against. Christ is Messiah. It's anointed one. It's Jesus Christ. It's Yeshua HaMashiach. Anything against Christ is Antichrist. Anyone against Christ is operating in a spirit of Antichrist. We are not going to be distracted and divided by pointing to specific individuals saying that person is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is actually not biblical language. There are many Antichrists. There is a spirit of Antichrist, and it operates in the sons of lawlessness, and those who do not believe, those who rage against the truth. Even in 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about the man of lawlessness, a much better and more accurate translation would call it the mankind of lawlessness. It's not a specific person. It's a specific spirit that is against. It's a body of spirits. It's a collection of those who are against the things of God, who are against the grace and truth that is in Jesus Christ. It is those who are sinning and encouraging others to sin. It is those who are sinning and persecuting believers and people who are speaking the truth. We combat this spirit of Antichrist with love, love for God, shown and demonstrated by our obedience to him, by keeping his commands, and our love for one another, which is the greatest command apart from the command to love God himself. Watch out for those who are trying to deceive you. I have written these things concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Do not be deceived. Love God. Obey God. Love one another. Watch out for those who teach you anything else. Watch out for those who are not loving. Watch out for those who deny the truth, who deny that Jesus came in the flesh. Watch out for those. If someone is sinning, don't take their teaching. If someone is walking in open, unrepentant sin and trying to tell you it's okay, don't believe them. They're not one of us. We should love one another. Not like Cain, who was jealous and therefore killed his brother. That's the spirit of Antichrist. And at the same time, don't forget that that's what's operating in the world. If the world hates you, 
Don't be surprised. Cain killed his brother because he was jealous, because his brother was righteous. How much more will the world hate you because you are righteous? This is how we've come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is fellow believers. Many of our churches today teach us that we are to love humanity, that we are to love our neighbor. I was rebuked on Facebook recently for a comment that was deemed unloving towards terrorists who are killing believers. Yes, we are to love our enemies, but we are commanded much more frequently in Scripture to love our brothers. Chapter 3, verse 16, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We are to lay down our lives for fellow believers. Jesus said we would be known by our love for one another, not our love for the world. We are to love the world. Jesus loves the world. Jesus came to show God's love for the world. God loves the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Many people in Christian nations around the many Christians around the world right now are at war. Many more very well might be at war in the coming months. We all must make up our own minds and hear directly from the Lord about what this means to love one another and to love our enemies. My personal conviction is to love and protect other believers and my family, even if that means fighting against those who would seek to harm other believers or my family. It's outrageous to me that there is a political debate happening about whether or not Christians should support defending those who are being attacked and murdered and raped. Sometimes perhaps the most loving thing you can do is to protect one who's under attack. Perhaps it should be the Christian who intervenes on the playground when a bully is pushing around someone smaller, someone incapable of defending themselves. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, for fellow believers. Chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love casts out fear. If we are afraid of God, it's because we don't really understand his love for us. Or it's because we're holding on to sin that we know we should let go of. Christians should fear God when they're not walking with him. But when you repent and you come to know his perfect love, it will drive out every fear. You'll no longer be afraid to approach him, to tell him the things that are on your heart. You won't have to be afraid of his eternal punishment. And when you fully understand his love for you and who you are in him, you won't have any other fears either. You won't be afraid of rejection. You won't be afraid of failure. You will just simply do the things he is calling you to do, and you'll sleep really well. The next verse says, We love him because he loved us first. He is the source of it all. No man looks to God without God having looked to that person first. And because this is true, he's the source of it all. We also must love one another. 
No one saying, I love, if someone says they love the Lord, but they don't love their brother or their sister, their fellow believer, they're a liar, it says here. And we have this command. If you love him, you will keep his commands. And this is the command that you love your fellow believers. And friends, if you're loving him and you're keeping his commands and you're loving your fellow believers, you can ask him for anything and he will do it. Whatever we ask in accordance with his will, he will provide it. Don't ask him for a Rolex. Don't ask him for a Lamborghini. Don't ask him for a mansion by the sea. If those are the things your heart desires, then you're probably not there yet. Those things aren't bad in and of themselves, and God will certainly give those to the people he loves who are walking with him, but those aren't our goal. Our goal is to love him more and to love people more to become more like him, for him to reveal in us the things that we need to change so that we can be his image bearers in a more effective way. Let's long for deeper revelation as to who he is. Let's long for a better understanding of how his heart beats. Let us be striving to have compassion on people the way he does to have a knowledge of the truth, to be able to share it the way Jesus did. How tremendously blessed we are to hear his voice, to have his spirit, to be in fellowship with him and with one another. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for being on this journey with me. We'll see you tomorrow.